Amen. Amen. Turn around, smile at somebody, say, good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. We welcome you to Solid Rock tonight, believing God for good and mighty things tonight. Amen. Before, let's just raise your hands towards heaven right now and ask the blessings of the Lord upon this service. Ask the presence of God. Touch every heart and every life tonight. Father, we come before the throne tonight. We thank you. We thank you for the victory. We thank you for that anointing tonight. God, we praise you for every song sung. God, the anointing of God upon it tonight. God, speak as a man of God. God, anoint him tonight. God, let the word of the living God stir and inspire our hearts. Save the lost tonight. Heal the sick. God, minister to every need tonight with the power of conviction. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Come on, let's just give the Lord a great big shout of praise. Amen. What he's done for me, Lord, what, what he's done, done. 
for me. What is done for me? What is done for me? What he's done for me! 
what he's done for you tonight. Hallelujah. Come on and praise him. Oh, you don't know like I know what he's doing for me. Well, you don't know like I know what he's done for me. Well, you don't know like I know what he's done for me. What he's done for me, Lord. What he's done for me. You can't tell like I can tell what he's done for me.
a good pan tonight. Give these beautiful singers, come on, love the Lord. Give them a good praise tonight, amen. I'll be glad that we'll have to climb a tree. We're going to do it tonight by the grace of God, amen. Hallelujah, you can be seated tonight. God bless you. Good to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. Had a great time and amen. God moved mighty while we were in revival in Florida, but I'm glad to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. God's a mighty good God. Appreciate the goodness of the Lord. We're going to receive tonight's offering now. And amen. As they come and receive the offering, I ask you to give tonight and let the Lord richly bless you. Amen. He's a mighty good God tonight. Amen. Give the Lord a great big shout of praise. Amen. Sister Rachel, come and sing for us tonight. Amen. Well, Seth, testify. Amen. Hallelujah. Give Sister Rachel a good hand tonight. Frankly, the only song that I can think of, I don't sing it here, Sister Robinson's. <laughs> Goodness of God. Because you know God is so good. Yes, he is. And it, and it goes right in with what we Come on. We've been singing tonight, and if you don't care, Reverend, I would like for you to sing it in my place. <laughs> but you know, God is good. Most of you were here probably Sunday night, but I'm going to do it again. We started Sunday night to come over here and uh, to get a deer, and it totaled Sheila's car, but God was good <laughs> because we were within 10 miles of my house. The sheriff saw it happen. He helped us call everybody, and he took me back home to get my vehicle, and we came on to church, and not, neither one of us was hurt. It didn't hit the windshield. It didn't, it didn't hit the windshield. It didn't hit my window. And it didn't jar my pacemaker and make it stop working. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, you don't think about that, but it's true. If, if I get a hard jar, it'll make my pacemaker stop working. <laughs> and, and that didn't happen. You know, so the goodness of God, the goodness of God. So if you don't mind, Robert. I love your voice. For your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake Till I lay my head, all I will see of your goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Of the goodness of God. No, my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, all I will see of the goodness. Bye. 
I in the darkest night. You were close like no other. I know you as a father, and I've known you as a friend. fire in the darkest night. You were close like no other. I know you as a father, and I've known you as a friend, and I been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head all I will see of your goodness of God yes in all my life you have been faithful the goodness of God. Yes. And all my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have, Lord. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing, I will sing. of the goodness of God. Your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up till we lay our heads. All I will see, Lord, of your goodness of God. Yes, and all my life you have been faithful.
Sing it again. All my life you have been good. Hallelujah. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am all I will sing of your goodness. God, I feel like singing again all my life. All of my life, you have been faithful. He's faithful when we're not, isn't he? All my life, everybody shout, he's been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. One more time. My, my. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Has he been good to you tonight? Has he been faithful to you tonight? Hallelujah. With every breath that I'm able, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on and give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's give him a solid rock. Hallelujah, Hallelujah praise tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, he's a mighty good God. Stand with me tonight if you would tonight. Amen. Amen. Would you make the man of God welcome, Brother Tim Cooper tonight. Amen. Give him and the Lord a great big shout of praise tonight. Amen. Thank you, praise team. I appreciate it. It is sure good to be back in the house of the Lord. You know, we uh, we miss Sunday, and you know, you say, "Well, you know, you miss one day." Sometimes that happens. 
But I want to tell you something. It, it Doesn't it always happen, just as Pastor has said time and time again, oh, you should have been at service on Sunday. <laughs> Man, we've been having some great services, but I heard you all blew it out of the house on Sunday. I heard the Lord was in this place. And you know what? He's the same Lord that's here tonight. That's the most amazing thing. When they were sitting there and, the, and they were talking about, singing about someone tells you what God has done for, for them. You know, you have to say, well, yeah, that's good. But, you know what? Why, why do we always have to throw that in there? Anything, if, if someone comes up and they tell you what God's done for them, that's a testimony. And, and you know, if we have to give a, a title to this thing, we're, we're going to go ahead and call it uh, Choose This Day Whom You Shall Serve. And we're going to get into something called Godly Counsel. Godly Counsel. This week I've been reading a lot in First and Second Kings. And I read about the numerous kings of old who ruled over Israel. And what I noticed the most while I was studying is how the king's decisions directed the destiny of the people, whether it be a positive way or a negative way. Just as Joshua declared the people in, in declared, declared to the people in Joshua 24 and 15. He said, choose whom they would serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Go ahead and stand and let's read that. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Join me with this part. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, I'm sure it's just me, and probably none of you have ever had this happen. But I can remember in my youth, I received instructions from my parents or siblings things which I should do, and things which I should avoid. And as many, I listened to some, and some not so much. Now, like I said, I know that's probably just me. Nobody ever has gone through that themselves. But why? Why do other people insist on telling you how to live your life? Isn't that what you hear every day now? You hear it? People saying, well, who are you to tell me how to live my life? Well, you know what? As I grow older, I find myself doing the exact same thing. And why is that? Because I care. You know what? I don't want you to make the same mistakes I did. I see this young generation coming up. And you see disrespect and you see just hatefulness and, and you want so much to grab the mother and say straighten that kid up if you can't handle him at four you ain't going to be able to handle him at 14 but the fact is that's not my call all I can do is say Lord straighten her up but I want to tell you something <clears throat> we insist on help trying to instruct other people because we don't want them to make the same mistakes we've made. Or we know if you do A, you're going to get B. But if you do X, you're going to get Y. So choose X. You, do, you want Y. You don't want B. We try to instruct them because we care. Many times we've made the mistakes we don't want them to make. Many times we've done made good decisions whether it be through someone else's wisdom or whether it be through godly counsel. Maybe the word of God has instructed us. And you know what? 
too many times today, we have it in our own mind, I'll get my own opinion. And that's where America is failing, falling short. I'm going to set this down for just a minute and get a drink of water. Please bear with me. If you don't mind, let's put Proverbs up there. Proverbs 12 and 15. Proverbs tells us that a wise and prudent person listens to godly counsel and instruction, but a fool rejects God's godly counsel and wisdom, and they are full of on their own ways. Now, that's, that's a little different than the version that I had, and I apologize for that. But you know what the point is? We've got to understand when we do things on our own, and we don't consult God on it. We don't consult people who are in leadership positions within the church body. Then we're going to make mistakes. And then we can't come back and blame God for it. You know, one of the things that Pastor's been hitting on, and he's absolutely right, is this Facebook thing. <clears throat> yeah, I spend way too much time on it. And you know what? What if I spent that much time in the Word of God? Yeah. Well, what if we all did? It doesn't take long for you to read the Bible and realize the same thing there as well. You know, in Judges chapter 14, Samson went to Timnah, and he saw a young Philistine woman there. And he came back and he told his parents he wanted her for his wife. Now, the typical parental response came up, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among your, our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? Well, we know that in Jewish custom, you stayed and married within your own group. Why? Because you would be led astray. Do not yoke yourself with unbelievers. Why does it say that? Well, it says it because of the fact you will be led astray if you're not careful. I had a nephew. Love him dearly. He called me and he asked me. He said, I've got a friend. I've known him my whole life. And we're looking to go into business together. I said, is he a Christian? He said, why does that matter? I said, because the Bible very specifically says, do not yoke yourself with unbelievers. Is he a Christian? He said, well, he believes in God. I said, you've said enough. No, don't do it. Don't do it. And he said, but don't you think by being in business with him that I might be able to convert him? I said, if you haven't been able to do it to this point, why would you think you could? Guess what? He didn't listen. Fourteen months later, my nephew, they lost a contract because they failed to meet their end of the deal. He was a fence post, uh, uh, fencer, and because of that, he actually was fined $8,300 that he gets to pay because the friend was not on the contract. Now, I believe that God gave me a word for my nephew. I believe that he rejected that godly word. And I believe that as a result of that, he is now paying a very dear price. Now, has anybody else ever rejected godly wisdom? Uh, look, look, we got some honest folks here. I like that. That's good. The fact is, we know that going back to, to judges here with Samson, we know that he should have married within his own upbringing his own group now I can almost see Samson when they said no I can almost see him throw himself on the ground and kick and scream and say but I want her mom I really like her 
Does it sound ridiculous? But you know what? In essence, that's what he did because he never gave in. He still wanted it nonetheless. He demanded that his parents go get that Philistine woman. Did he disobey his parents? Exodus 20 and 12. Honor thy mother, thy father and mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord giveth thee. That makes sense, right? So he failed. But then there's that other part. You know, when I read that, I, buddy, I knew, yep, he failed. He dropped the ball. But then that other part. That was good instruction, though, the parents gave him, wasn't it? Stay home, pick your own. He did, in a way, disobey his parents. But then. But then in Judges 14 and 4, it reads, We'll wait till we get there. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord. What? That he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So there you have to say, did he disobey his parents? Yes. Yes. Was it all according to God's will? It was. Now, here's the difference. How do we know when it's our will and when it's God's will? Would it be by listening to godly counsel? If someone in the church that you respect and you've seen God work through them comes up and gives you a word of God, you better pay attention. Now, I'm going to throw something out there, and it's not going to go over very well. Be cautious who you get your counsel from. Gentlemen, ladies, if you're having problems in your marriage or you're not married yet, please don't get your counsel from your friends who have been married three times, okay? Let's not do that. Come and make a meeting with the pastor. He's got a little time under his belt. I think they can help you out, okay? But but the point is just that. We need to make sure that the counsel we get, first of all, does it line up with this word? Because if anyone gives you counsel other than what is in here, turn and walk away and do it quickly. We've got to realize this world is full of hypocrisy. They are complete hypocrites. They say one thing, they do another, and it isn't close to anything in this word of God. Except back here in the end, when it says in the end days. Folks, we're in the end days. And we are in those perilous times. But you know what? It used to bother me. Now I say, come quickly, Lord, come quickly. Because I want to tell you something. It's not going to change his word. Nothing we do is going to change his word except pray. And our goal is not for ourselves, But our goal is for those who are still lost and don't know Jesus Christ. We need to realize we also need to weigh out whatever godly counsel someone may give you. All right, parents, here you go. You get a call. Your little boy pushed my little girl down today. He did what? Oh, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to get right down to the bottom of this right now. Hey, boy, get in here. You know how it would be. What in the world's wrong with you? you know, I told you you never hit a girl. You never push them down. What's wrong with you? You done lost your mind. Let's try a different approach. 
let me find out what's going on and I'll call you back. Son, can I talk to you? Yes, Daddy. What happened today at school? He said, Daddy, we were sitting there at the bus stop and this car jumped up on the curb. And if I hadn't pushed this little girl out of the way, she'd have got run over. Uh, sir, I talked to my son. Can you verify with your daughter that a car had jumped up on the curb and he pulled her out of the way? Well, let me check. So all of a sudden, your little boy went from being a bully to being a hero. Now, what's the difference in the circumstances, the way it was worded? You know what? In this world, they can take things and they can word it in a way that sounds so good so appealing and they can convince you that things are as they say but the fact is that only Jesus Christ is the truth we all have our mindset of how things are going to be we all have our preset con emotions or, or preset uh, so I say conditions of, of the way things should be and we're going to strive to make sure that things turn out that way. So we all have those things in us that help us to lean to our own beliefs as others on the other side have their beliefs. But we come back to the one thing that is constant, this word of God. Pastor, I need to talk to you about something. Okay, Brother Tim, meet me at the church. And you know what? I've got his ear. And I can talk to my pastor, and I can know that I'm going to get what is in this book. How do I know? How do I know? Because I've seen him live it in the short time we've been here. He doesn't, he doesn't just talk it. He lives it. And you know what? That's the example you're looking for. I'm not talking. Don't be talking to that person who sits and goes, oh, I just love you to death. And the next thing you know, they're to backbiting you. They're talking about you. They're telling stories behind your back. When you went into that kind, you just need to go, okay, Lord, help them. Because I want to tell you something. You're going to run into it. And you know where you see it the most? See, I didn't have to say it. Y'all did. The church is the only place where we kill our own wounded. You know, it's supposed to be a place where we can come and be healed. But, again, a lot of that depends upon who you're listening to. When the pastor says, if you're hurt, if you need healing, and he and the Spirit of God is moving in this place, and you sit back there and say, I will not be moved, you know what? You are turning away the godly counsel that is available to you. You are turning away the healing that God is offering to you. And when that happens, you can only blame yourself for not receiving what God has for you. When we turn away from godly counsel, then we are basically turning away from the help that God has sent us. We've all heard the story many times. I think pastors used it a few times here about the guy in the flood on top of his house. Quick, flood's coming, get in the boat. Nope. God will save me. Another guy comes by. Hey, on a helicopter. Come on, get in the boat. Get in the helicopter. Come on, come on, climb up the rope. I'll, we'll save you. Nope, God will save me. What happens? The flood keeps rising and he drowns. He gets to heaven and he says, Lord, I thought you were going to save me. He said, well, I sent you a boat and a helicopter. What do you want? Is that true? None of us. How many times has God sent us help? And we go, nope, mm-mm. 
I ain't talking to that sister. She hurt my feelings. Oh, my goodness. Seriously? Get over yourself. I want to tell you something. We, we've got to realize that, that there are times all throughout the Bible where people rebel against God. People rebel against the people of God. When those people take it upon themselves to get revenge, then they fail. You know, we look over here in, in Kings, 1 Kings chapter 12. After, you know, you actually in chapter 11 you read about Jeroboam, how he had, he had rebelled against Solomon. And as a result, when Solomon sought out to kill him because of his rebellion, he fled. He fled to Egypt. But then in Kings chapter 12, after Solomon dies, Rehoboam takes over as king. And now Jeroboam comes back. Here he is now. It's a different story. Now he's, go ahead and put up chapter 12, verse 4, 1 Kings. He comes back and he's looking for an easier way. And Pastor, you even preached on this not long ago. He said, listen, thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make thou grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. That was Jeroboam asking this of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, of course, was, again, Solomon's son. He was the new king. And he said unto them, Depart. For three days, then come again, and the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise me that I may answer this people? And he said, Speak, spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant of this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. The end. No. See, that's why you can't have a preacher in the place because he knows the word too good. That isn't how it ends, is it? Bubba! Yo, Bubba, come on over here and tell me what I ought to do. He called all of his friends together. Now, the first set, I would consider that godly counsel. They served with Solomon. They were his wise men, his counsel, his trusted confidants. But then it didn't quite work that way. He forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. How many of you in this place really want your friends giving you advice? Especially the ones you grew up with. Now, yeah, I hear a little, mm -mm -mm -mm. yeah, exactly. You know what? I wouldn't want me giving me advice at that age. So I I'm sitting here thinking about it now. I'm thinking, oh, no, no, no. I don't want these people hanging around me trying to give me advice. But nevertheless, Rehoboam had a different view. He said, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father put upon us lighter? And the young men that were grown up with him spoke, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shall they say unto them, My little fingers shall be thicker than my father's loins. And you're going, what? In other words, he's badder than his daddy was. And now, whereas my father did laid you with heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. If someone comes to you, 
and they're asking, ease my pain. Is this what you want your answer to be? Ease my yoke. Lighten my burden. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Let's, order that, let's add an extra 100 pounds on that burden, that load. And, and instead of you carrying it 10 miles, we're going to make it 20. So this is, this is the mindset he had because of his wonderful counsel of his dear friends. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old man's counsel that they gave him. And they spake to him after counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Are you at this point thinking, what a loser? I know I was. Man, what is wrong with you? How could you take that godly counsel and toss it aside and believe this is the best way to go? But wait. Here we go again. In verse 15, it says, Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people for the cause was from the Lord. That he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. 1 Kings eleven twenty nine through 33. Did I not give you that one, Daniel? I'm sorry. I apologize. Can we get 1 Kings 11, 29. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam, excuse me, trying to see which, where Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way and he clad himself with a new garment and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him, and he rent it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take these 10 pieces, for thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give, you, give 10 tribes to thee. Now we need to understand, this was before the scriptures I previously read. Why in the world would this happen? Well, let's try one more scripture. Let's go ahead and let's look at 1 Kings 11, 1 and 2. And I'm sorry, Daniel, that I didn't give you these earlier. I thought I'd written them down. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, what does it say? Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn you your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Now, let's go ahead to the next verse if you have it there. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and in his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, it was the heart of David his father. Now, again, we're backing up. When does God's word go unanswered? If we read this word and we study it and we determine that his word is true, then when, at what point will this word not occur? It won't. 
If God says it, it's going to happen. So we know that there was a punishment for the disloyalty of Solomon. It was prophesied to Jeroboam. And it came to pass, as we know. So when all of Israel saw that the king, and here we are back, I'm sorry, we're back to Kings chapter 12, and we're in verse 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thy own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. Next verse, please. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. And what did we have? We had two portions. We had two. And we know that of the other ten tribes, we know where they were. They were with Jeroboam. So that because of the insolence of Solomon, and we say, well, no, it was, it was Rehoboam who did this. No, it was a continuation of the act of his father. The sins of the father, how many? Third generation. Well, what I do, it only affects me. How many of you said that before? I have. I have. And guess what? Now I realize what a foolish statement that is. It doesn't. Now, I don't have children, so at least in that respect we're safe, unless you count my animals. But the thing about it is, as parents, realize your actions will affect your children up to three generations. We know that Rehoboam sent out an agent of his who was over the tribute to go collect. And what happened? He was stoned to death. That showed that there was no longer any respect for the position that he held. And again, when you fall out of the grace of God, any authority that you had is quickly lost. What gives us the authority of God? Our life, our action, our commitment to God. There are times when actions are achieved through God's direction. There are times where the direction comes from the word of God. There are times where it comes from someone, as we spoke earlier, that you trust who is God's anointed person. But be cautious. Compare everything to this word. If, in fact, we choose not to follow God's word, then you are bringing damnation upon yourself. You are bringing turmoil upon yourself. And what we need to realize in this world that we live in, it's going to be tough enough anyway. I mean, we think we've seen tough times now. We haven't seen anything. So we as the church body need to prepare. And, you know, we have to actually ask that question. Okay, this is all great, you know, nice history lesson. But what is the real point here, Brother Tim? Well, I'm glad you asked. What godly counsel are you accepting? What godly counsel are you giving? You know what? I I heard one father say that he was, a, he was a, a, a Christian counselor, and he was constantly gone. And when he would come home, sometimes he would be tired, he'd be irritable, and one day he snapped at one of his young children. And his, child, his child got his feelings hurt, and he went to bed, and his father sat there, and he said, I, I cannot let this happen. What, what's, wrong, what's going on here? So he went to the child And he knelt down at the child's bed and he said, will you please forgive me? The child looked at him and he said, what do you you mean forgive you? He said, because I shouldn't have treated you that way. You deserve better. Will you forgive me? 
He said, old people need forgiving too? And he said, yes, son, probably more than young people do. And he said, especially me. He said, I'm supposed to be a Christian, and I didn't act like a Christian. He said, will you forgive me? He said, Daddy, I, didn't for I forgave you when I walked up here. Well, you know what? We need to have that mindset that when we make a mistake, we need, we need to call out to not only God, absolutely to God, but we also need to call out to whomever we may hurt and say, look, I made a mistake, and I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? But again, how can you know what's right and wrong other than to get into this word? We have got to be a light in a dark world, especially now. And this world is, is really in bad shape, and it's not going to get better. But we have got to be that light in the dark world, so we've got to get the church in line with what the word says. I, I saw something the other day, and it said, if the church today is the church that's in the New Testament, I don't want any part of it. Ouch. That hurts. Let me ask you a question. When you see your neighbor going through something, do you ease across the street? I knew he was no good for you. I knew it. He, I've seen him. I knew him for back. No. No. No, no, no. How about, sister, what can I do to help? I'm praying for you. You don't need to throw your two cents worth in. That's not godly counsel. That's not godly counsel at all. You know what? I know there's still hope for him. I know, I, I believe with everything I am, and I'm going to make it a special point to continue to pray for him day and night. I don't want you praying for him. I hope he burns in, no, 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 uh-uh. No, you don't. You're angry now, but don't say it. Let's pray for him. Let's do it right now. And that's when you pray for that person to let go of the hurt that they're dealing with. And you go ahead and you pray for that person who, who is doing the wrong. And you ask God to deal with that situation according to his will. We've got to realize that we have to be someone that when people look at us, they see something different. You know what? There's times at work where I get so frustrated, I just, I'll say something and I'll be like, oh my goodness, where in the world did that come from? And I know where it came from. And that's when you have to go back and you go, you know what? I am really sorry. That was uncalled for. I shouldn't have acted that way. No, it's okay. No, it's not. You may say it's okay, but it's not okay. But please accept my forgiveness, and I'll try to do much better than that. Well, you know what? We can all come up with excuses why we act the way we act. But the fact of the matter is, there are no excuses. If we proclaim to be followers of Christ, then be followers of Christ. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm a Christian. Really? Why? I believe in Jesus. Satan believes in Jesus. Does that make him a Christian? No. So that shoots that theory down, doesn't it? So what makes you a Christian? It's a whole lot easier saying you're a Christian than it is to say I'm a follower of Christ. Be a follower of Christ. Joshua 24 and 15. If you've been a Christian any longer than a week, you've probably heard this a thousand times. It's almost as popular as John 3, 16. So we know that Joshua addressed the people before they crossed over into the promised land. And as we read earlier, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. 
But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Again, we live in a fallen world, but we're here for a purpose. Parents, continue to instill in your children the word of God. Your grandchildren. Folks, I want to tell you something. Jody and I were sitting in the back here looking up at these prayer lines. It thrills me to no end to see these children coming up praying for adults. I say, Lord, let that authority coming out of that child and that faith that's coming out of that child. Why do they come up? Because they see others doing it and say, this is what we're supposed to do. But I want to tell you something. There is no more, or let me rephrase, there's no less authority in that child's hands when they lay it on there because they're praying with faith. You know what? Let that child come up and pray for Uncle Tim here. I'm telling you right now because I want some of that prayer. I, they believe it. I believe it. And God's going to do it. So that's the way we need to be. Seeing these children coming up and praying for people, it just thrills me to no end, and I say thank you, Lord, for a living, breathing church. When the children go, so goes the church. As Christians, we need to strive to share the word of God, the light of the world, with those who may not accept it at the time. However, it may indeed be the very thing they need. That may be the only godly counsel that they get. It's a new year. God doesn't want your New Year's resolutions. God wants you to be a new creation. Well, I've been a Christian since I... I don't care. God doesn't care how long you've been. Are you a follower of Christ today? You know, I had a lady tell me one time when we first got saved... Well, that zeal that you have, that'll fade away. Folks, we don't need wet blankets in the church putting out the fires. We need people sitting there fanning it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Put it on them, Lord. Put it on them. Oh, pick him back up and let's pray for him some more. That's what we need. We need people to get serious about serving the Lord. I'm paced up and down here because Pastor led me like a... Remember, remember me being his prayer? Remember me being the one who was singing ahead of time, telling you about, glory to God, oh, you are most worthy. And what happened? What happened? He started giving God the praise. And Jesus said, I know you did because I did. Why do we stop? Oh, well, Brother Tim, I just don't do that. Try it. You might like it. When we get serious about God and don't care what anybody else thinks, God's going to start doing things that's going to throw this world on its head. We've got to be willing to do it, though. What did I say, Brother Seth? What did I say in the prayer room? What do we want? What do we want in 2023? How much of God do we want, right? You know what? I want more than I had in 2022. But it's going to require more commitment than I gave in 2022. We're not talking, like I said, we're not talking about a, a New Year's resolution. We're just talking about a new commitment. So here we are. What is it, the fourth? Fourth of the, month, the year. You get to decide. Do I want more of God than I had last year? Or am I content with what I have? Fill yourself with God's word. Prepare to hear the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Be attentive to those who seek you out and you know are, are God's counselors. Those who have godly wisdom, those who have a word of knowledge, those who aren't afraid to use the gifts of the Spirit, but compare it, weigh it out against the word of God. I'm going to ask you one question, 
and I would be remiss. And I'm, I, I, a couple times I, I've just turned the service back to pastor. I'm not going to do it tonight. I'm going to say right now, if there's anyone here who has walked away from God or you don't know God, I'm going to ask you right now, just lift your hand up. All right, praise God, no hands. I'm going to say this. Is there anybody here who wants a closer walk with the Lord? Praise God, that's wonderful to see. I'm going to ask every one of you, stand up right where you are. Lift your hands to the Lord. Don't lift them this way, look them straight up to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and we thank you. Oh, Lord, your presence during the praise and worship, we thank you for that. Father, we thank you that we have a pastor who lives and breathes your word. And we thank you, Lord, that he lives that word. But, Lord, we're calling out right now. and We're asking for more, more than we've had in the past. Lord, we want to see that mighty move of God, not within the church, but within us. We are the church. So, Lord, right now, everybody who has their hands lifted up, we ask, Lord, right now, anoint them for your service. Touch them, Lord, and let them be a light in this dark world. If there's anyone who needs special prayer, you need a healing in your body, come forward right now. Let us pray for you. There are many people in this church who want to pray for you. I thank you all. I thank every one of you for being here tonight. But most of all, I thank you for choosing this Lord that we call Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Pastor, I'm going to turn it over to you at this time.
undecided. Take it, everybody. Oh, come on. Undecided tonight. I have decided to follow Jesus. in this body. God, all these issues tonight. God, I believe that you're the healer. Let's give the Lord and the Word of God, the man of God, a great big hand tonight. Come on, hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a praise tonight. Hallelujah. How many knows you heard some good instructions tonight? How many knows that good instructions will bless you tonight? Amen. And uh, God's just a mighty good God tonight. How many been blessed to be in the house of the Lord? How many been blessed to hear the Word of the Lord tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. God's good.